Tonight, the crippling coal miners' strike in the Soviet Union spreads yet again. Health Minister Neil Blewett takes defamation action against two top doctors. And a bastion of British chauvinism crumbles under a female attack. Good evening and thanks for joining us on Late Edition. First tonight to the Soviet Union where President Mikhail Gorbachev has made large concessions to thousands of striking coal miners. The President's been forced to yield in a bid to bring under control snowballing industrial trouble which is strangling the economy. But despite his efforts, the trouble is still spreading. Striking miners lie slumped, exhausted along the main street of this Siberian town. For these men, there's been nothing but hardship since the strike call 10 days ago. In the heart of the Siberian coal fields, Prokopievsk is experiencing its first strike since the revolution. The miners, angry and disillusioned, battle to remain united as their colleagues elsewhere accept new government concessions. They're trying to divide us, to split our community down the middle, these miners told me. They warned that such tactics could only lead to violence. The papers talk of the miners having already returned to working underground. Misinformation that is treated with contempt. Reports from Moscow that these men have given up their strike has caused immense anger here. Defiant, they say they won't go underground until their demands are met in full. A few men, like Alexei Tretniev, continue to carry out essential repairs on the mines. He knows that whatever happens, mining is the town's only livelihood. He says the root of the problem is the food supply and the low living standards. There is just nothing to buy, he complains. The mine he works in is one of the oldest and most dangerous in the country, leaving dozens of miners injured every year. Siberian miners like Alexei are proud men, once hailed as the heroes of Soviet economic performance. But now, despite the punishing conditions, they feel undervalued and betrayed by their leaders. Their families are among the most impoverished of anywhere in the Soviet Union. And everyone complains of desperate housing conditions. The children are left bewildered by the sense of crisis that is now enveloping this mining community. A Philippines airline plane with about 100 people on board has crashed in Manila. The BAC-111 overshot a runway, hit a concrete wall and bounced onto the city's southern expressway, crushing at least four vehicles. Latest reports say eight people in the vehicles were killed. Some passengers on the plane received minor injuries. Meanwhile, in the United States, survivors of yesterday's DC-10 air crash are praising the cockpit crew as heroes. The crew were among the 184 survivors of the crash. 109 were killed or are missing presumed dead. It's been revealed the pilot of the DC-10 had almost no control over the jet in the final 34 minutes before it crash-landed. Aviation officials were today surveying the wreckage of Flight 232 strewn across the Sioux City Airport. The trouble began 30 minutes earlier, when the engine in the tail exploded, spewing out metal parts which sheared off the tail cone of the plane. That was found today 100 kilometres from the crash site, along with other parts of the damaged engine. It's believed the flying engine pieces caused the failure of the plane's hydraulic systems. These systems control the wing flaps, slats, rudder and stabilisers vital to the plane's control. We were banking a lot. It seemed like he was having difficulty uh, controlling the plane. Without its hydraulic systems, the plane was able to make only very wide right turns. It spiraled down in three huge circles, while another pilot in the area heard the crew tell air controllers they were preparing for a ditch landing. The DC-10 almost did make it to the Sioux City Airport. The plane dipped into the ground just short of the runway and cartwheeled down the tarmac. Investigators are amazed so many survived. Many of the survivors sat between rows 9 and 19 in the largest remaining piece of the fuselage. If there were groups of people in seats, and uh, what was so unusual about it, some were alive, some were dead. Today, the plane's flight recorder arrived in Washington for analysis. 
That and the evidence of the flight crew should make for an easier inquiry. But it could be months before there's an official verdict.